that's good. Okay, Seeing his. Is it the, it's the full one, it's not the next slide okay, one or anything. Jump to this other side, which is weird. Okay, and then we need to record. I... Not to record me, it's not with it. It's just something inappropriate at some point. Talk to your anyway. Are you already recording? Need to record. Uh, <laughs> that's what I was going to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, I remember this from 2010. <laughs> No, no, I just wanted to make sure it was going. Dressing this morning. I just it's like that backwards. It's meant to be on the side because of the way it's out. Oh, oh yeah, there we go. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, we'll be doing a presentation by Dr. Plone in just a moment, followed by M&M for the red and blue services. So it's uh, always a pleasure to introduce Dr. Plone. Uh, Dr. Plone's an associate professor here in our department. He's been on staff in, uh, with UW Urology since I believe 2001, is that correct, Dr. Plone? Um, Dr. Plone went to medical school at the University of Chicago, followed by his residency at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, trained under some of the, the giants in urology, including uh, Andy Novick and Carl Drogo Montague, uh, apropos to this talk right now about uh, the penile reconstruction of Peyronie's disease. Uh, he has a special interest in men's health urology and is going to be presenting to us this morning about Peyronie's disease. Dr. Plone. Thanks, Dan. Uh, all right. So... Peyronie's disease is one of my particular interests, uh, especially Zyaflex these days is the main thing I'm doing with it. So there was a Dr. Peroni uh, who first described this and got his name associated with it. So he was a court physician in France in the uh, mid uh, 18th century. So basically Peyronie's disease is a condition characterized by the formation of a fibrous nodule within the tunica albiginia of the corpus cavernosum and so that can result in various degrees of penile deformity and sexual dysfunction. So, you know, obviously the tunica uh, uh, albiginia is elastic, and so when a man gets an erection, the penis goes from one size to a larger size with the, uh, uh, with the um, corpora filled with blood under high pressure, giving rigidity. So the analogy I use for patients that I think they find very helpful in describing this is I say, imagine you've got a deflated balloon Take a piece of scotch tape, put it on the balloon, now blow the balloon up. That's essentially what's happening. The, the scotch tape would prevent the rubber underneath it from having the elastic properties of the rest of the balloon, and so you're going to bend to the, uh, the direction of scotch tape. I said the, the penis is essentially a balloon that fills with blood, not air, and when you've got a plaque on part of the corpora, it's acting like that scotch tape on the balloon. So pa patients can conceptualize and visualize that, and I think it's very helpful to present it that way. So I, I say that to every patient, I just give, give that analogy. So how prevalent is this? So historically thought to be really rare. So a study from uh, back about 30 years ago thought that the uh, prevalence was maybe 0.4%, 388 cases out of every 100,000, uh, with the average on set about 53. A more recent study from 2000 looking in Germany, found that it was a little bit higher prevalence, you know, about 3.2% with the prevalence increasing as, you know, made, uh, men's age ranges went up and the median age of that, 57.4. Uh, uh, one study from 20 years ago in Brazil found about 3.7% of men um, and that erectile dysfunction was uh, higher uh, in men with Peyronie's disease. A good study from John Mulhall in New York City uh, from about 18 years ago, actually found it to be about 8.9%. So this was men who presented for prostate cancer screening to the urology department without you know, any concerns or complaints of, about Peyronie's disease, but were very carefully asked about symptoms of it and also very carefully examined uh, to see if they had any uh, signs of Peyronie's disease. And they found it to be 8.9%. Their mean age was a little bit older, six, uh, 68 years. So, you know, what I tell men is it's probably somewhere in the 5 to 10% range of varying degrees of severity. So a lot of guys with very mild cases may never come to attention. 
um, but the you know, probably not, you know, not super common, but not super rare either. So what's the etiology? Why does this happen? So there's thought to be a genetic component. Uh, it occurs more often in men with Dupuytren's contracture of the hands. Part of my history, I always ask, do you have any history of Dupuytren's? Anybody in your family? I you know will pay careful attention looking at their hands to see if they have any evidence of that. Trauma, another standard question when I, you know, I'm seeing a, a new patient with Peyronie's disease is, do you recall anything that happened either with intercourse or any other accident or sports uh, in the several months before you first started noticing symptoms in your penis? Um, the vast majority don't. Uh, but I always ask the question because once in a while, a guy will say, yeah, we were having intercourse, it bent, you know, we maybe didn't have a full on penile fracture, but something happened and then a few months later, the disease started. So there's a history of about 25% of men. Um, so it's important to ask that question, at least document you know, you know, what may have happened to let, that would lead to this. And it often helps the patients get a better understanding, hey, this is why this happened, just didn't happen out of the blue. Now, it's important to remember, Peyronie's disease is different than congenital curvature. So curvature, congenital curvature is gonna be present since childhood. You know, you, know, you know, the guy who comes in, especially a younger guy, hey, I've got penile curvature. Well, is this something new or is this something you've always had? Always had, that's probably congenital. Um, also, the examination of a guy with congenital curvature, it's basically normal. I mean, when they're in the flaccid state, you can't palpate any plaques, not that long cord that you sometimes see on the dorsum. Uh, and congenital curvature tends to more to be ventral or you know, right or left, whereas Peyronie's disease, the majority of the time is dorsal. So that's another differentiation. Um, you know, obviously, you're going to be treat these things very differently. Um, all right, so how, what's the pathophysiology? What's the process? So the theory is that there is some kind of an injury to the tunica albuginea, and then you can get trapping of fibrin within the layers of the tunica. There's overproduction of cytokines, including TGF-beta. You get destruction of the elastic fiber and overproduction of inelastic collagen. So that collagen then presents a target that we'll talk about later as one of the medical treatments. There's transformation of fibroblasts, and so this process just ramps up and you get excessive scar, focal loss of elasticity, and then the clinical manifestation is pain, bending or curvature. Often guys complain of indentation, they can get an hourglass deformity depending upon the orientation or shape of the scar. And shortening is very, very often associated with this. That's one of the complaints that every guy has um, about you know, their Peyronie's disease is just how much shorter their penis is, how much limited it is in its elasticity. <clears throat> so you know, remember, there's an outer longitudinal layer on the tunica and an inner circular layer. And so the thought is somehow with trauma, you can get some separation of this and you get blood in there, you get that process going with the excess collagen deposition and the fibroblasts, and then that starts the thickening of this. The plaques are often on the dorsal midline. If you've seen a lot of guys with Peyronie's disease, that's probably the most common location. And you, know, you may ask yourself, well, why is that? So one theory is that the penis is almost like an I-beam um, because of that interceptum. If you, look at the, if you think about the corpora on either side of this with that interceptum, and in construction, I-beams on the top part are often where bearing the majority of the tension. And so the thought is when the penis is receiving tension during intercourse, it's that top part of the I-beam that's actually suffering the, the biggest stress. And that's what leads to it often occurring on the, you know, the dorsal midline. <clears throat> so what's the natural history? Um, you know, so some guys come in very early. Some guys come in and say, oh, yeah, it's been this way for five years. You know, that's, those are very different patients as to what the expectation is going to be moving forward. But for guys who come in you know, very early, and there's a study from 30 years ago that you know, had men you know, with a wide variety of durations, but 94% had spontaneous resolution of pain. So it's one thing that you can with confidence tell men who are having pain with erections. That will get better. It may take time, but the pain nearly uniformly you know, will go away. You know, that pain just with an erection, not even attempting intercourse, just the, the you know, got an erection, it hurts in the penis. That will get better. 28% in this study had a resolution of the curvature, 36% had no change, 36% developed some progression of their curvature. So John Mulhall did a study where he you know, followed men also, 
246 men without any kind of treatment. So only 12% improved, 40% remained stable, 48% worsened. So you know, historically, a lot of men were told, oh, it's, this can get better on its own. I think that's rare. And I have some anecdotal you know, cases where men have come back and said, yeah, it, 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 was, it was 45 degrees for a long time. And then all of a sudden, you know, now it's under 30 degrees. It's not a problem. I don't think I need any treatment. So that may happen, but it's a rare case. The majority of men, it's either going to be the way it's going to be from there on after, once they have the curvature, or if they're early on, it may continue to progress. Um, so, uh, you know, when guys come in really early, I'll often just set up a three-month follow-up so that I can re-examine them, have them do another set of digital photos, and just see if there's progression. Once we see that there's stability, then we're more likely going to talk about treatment. So, natural history. Pain with erections is often the first sign of onset. You know, that's, again, a part of my standard history. You know, do you have pain with erections? When did that start? When did the curvature start relative to the pain starting? And you know, often men will first start having pain with erections. They may wake them up at night if they're having nocturnal erections. And then somewhere later, either you know, a few months, uh, even a few weeks, that's when all of a sudden, almost overnight, the erection goes from being straight to having this new curve. But pain often first, then the curvature. Again, the pain may occur for 12 to 18 months. Hopefully it ceases sooner but for the guys who've had it for many months, you've got to let them know, hey, this could be a year, year and a half of the pain with erections, but it will go away ultimately. And then we know that it's stable once the pain resolves and you're seeing stability in the curvature. The curvature doesn't seem to be progressing over time. So you want to delay, especially surgical intervention, until pain resolves and you see that the curvature isn't changing over time. So going you know, back to the diagnosis, how do I you know, address these men when I see them in the clinic for the first time? Ask about trauma, ask about any you know, history of penile fracture or something that sounds close to penile fracture, uh, if they've ever been treated for Dupertrens, if they've done injection therapy. You know, that's one of the risks of injection therapy, intracorporeal, you know, intracorporeal injection therapy for ED, is if they keep hitting the same spot, that's localized trauma, they can develop a plaque there. That's why it's important to educate men to rotate where they're giving themselves an injection so they're not hitting the same spot over and over and inducing a plaque there. But I just saw a man uh, uh, within the last week who's been doing injections for about five years and now has a new onset of curvature. So it does happen with the injection therapy. You want to ask about the penile deformity. What are they describing? What do they experience? Pictures are great. You know, I always try to make sure men can get some digital photos of their um, of their penis prior, to, their erect penis prior to seeing me, that's helpful. It's not perfect, and there's some unreliability with the photos, but it's something to be able to get a sense of what they're experiencing. It's also important to ask about interference with intercourse, right? I mean, you could have a penis that's you know very bent, but if, if their sex life is fine, if the functionality is fine, they don't necessarily need treatment. So you want to ask, you know, does it make it difficult mechanically for penetration because of the curve or because of some other element of the deformity, like a hinge effect if they've got a, 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 a you know, the hourglass deformity? Uh, is it, does it tend to buckle when they try to penetrate because of that? Uh, these are all things to document. You know, is there pain for the man when he's attempting intercourse because of the curve? And especially, is there pain for the partner? Is the, the curvature, you know, causing distress with intercourse? Um, and it's something that you know, we would need to fix just to make uh, intercourse something that's less painful. Whether or not they're having penile pain, again, good to document that. And again, how much distress, how much is this affecting their sex life? I stress over and over to men, this is a functional disease. It's not a cosmetic disease. Our whole goal is to make sure your penis is functional so that you can have satisfactory intercourse. It's not just to make it look straighter, it's the functionality. If the functionality is already there without us doing anything, we don't necessarily need to do anything but surveillance. But even with relatively mild, mild cases, if it's, you know, functionality is impaired, that's where we can talk about therapy. Um, it's important to ask about their erectile function. So that's one of my, I get standard questions. Has your rigidity changed? Are you having more difficulty maintaining or getting a full firm erection? And a lot of guys will say, no, the, the erection's rigid, but it's bent. Uh, other men, though, are having some if issues with ED on top of it, or 
they may have ED that predates the Peyronie's disease. Oh, I've, I've been using Viagra for five years, and now I've got this curve. Those are all important things to document because it's going to impact what treatment you may offer to them. And then there is a Peyronie's disease questionnaire that uh, I don't personally use, but it's out there in case you want to have something that's a more validated, standardized way to get their history. On exam, I have it, uh, I examine them typically standing uh, with me seated on a stool. And so basically I'm checking the elasticity of the penis. I'm palpating for the plaque. And generally it's one hand holding the penis on stretch and the other hand just kind of palpating along the dorsal aspect of the uh, shaft, feeling for the plaque. Uh, sometimes they're lateral. The ventral ones are the more challenging ones to, uh, to examine, but sometimes they're pretty obvious too. And I'll draw myself right after I examine them on a piece of paper that I have, I'll draw a picture and I'll kind of shade in where the plaque is so that when I dictate the chart later, I can describe it in really good detail and I have a standard way of kind of describing it. So when I look back three months later, seeing the patient again in clinic, I can remember what I felt at the time based on my description and my note to know, okay, this is bigger, this is different in some way. Uh, so just standardizing a way that you describe the plaques is important. Uh, the size, the number, the location, the character of it. Um, you know, also make note, it feels really calcified or it's soft, it's tender, you know, all those elements you want to document. And then stretch penile length is always a good thing to, to record because any you know, intervention could affect penile length and the disease itself affects penile length. So it's good to say, oh, here's where you were when we started, when I first saw you, you were already probably shorter because of the disease itself, not by anything that I've done. And then photos, a digital camera is very helpful these days. When I was a resident, you know, 25 years ago, guys would have to buy Polaroid cameras and take Polaroid pictures of their penis and bring them in to Dr. Montague and then we had paper charts, there's no electronic medical records. So we would take the polar pictures and we tape them into their, their paper charts so that we have that to be able to record. But, but yeah, the Polaroid photos that they would come in with and we'd be looking at was uh, a little historical. So now the digital camera makes it easy for everybody to just get a, you know pictures right before the appointment. They're not entirely reliable. So that's something you gotta you remember that uh, if the patient doesn't have a really full erection, it could underestimate how severe their curve is. So it's, it's a piece of data, it's very useful, but it's not as good as an in-office erection. So the guidelines, and I would recommend everybody read the guidelines uh, because it's got some good, good stuff in there, but an in-office erection is really gonna tell you the best what they have um, and you should, Definitely do that before any surgical intervention. You don't want to trust what a guy is describing to you as his curve, take him to the operating room, do the first erection you know, that you're going to see with, you know, for him in the operating room with him under anesthesia, and he's got 10 degree curvature. And you're like, what are we doing here? Um, so you definitely, before doing any kind of surgery, want to do an in-office erection with a papaverin injection is typically what I would do. Um, sometimes they don't get great erections. That could be challenging. Um, you need to be prepared to knock them down if it doesn't go down. So as our standard kit, when I see guys for um, Zyflex injections, so part of the cycle of Zyflex injections is to do an erection so you can see the uh, point of maximum concavity. So I have Paverin and I've got the phenylephrine in a liter uh, of normal ejectable saline so I can dilute some phenylephrine and knock them down if I have to. And I've had to do that a number of times. So def definitely need to be prepared to, to knock them down if you do do an artificial erection. Uh, radiographic studies. So ultrasound and MRI uh, can be helpful. Uh, I don't routinely get imaging. I think that I can examine and get a good idea of the sense of the size and the location of the plaque just on exam. Um, but if there's something weird about the story, then there's nothing wrong with getting an ultrasound or an MRI. I, I remember a case from residency, you know, again, many, many years ago, with a man, probably 40-ish, who was being treated for Peyronie's disease at an outside institution for like a year. And it was just a really weird story because there wasn't much curvature, but there was a lot of, quote, plaque. Um, and ultimately, he came to see Dr. Angermeyer, and we examined him, and just something wasn't right you know, about this penis, the way it, it, it felt. So we did an MRI and he had this infiltrative mass through his corpora and he had an angiosarcoma. Uh, so just, you know, when there's something just, just doesn't feel right, sound right about the history, about the exam, 
there's nothing wrong with doing an ultrasound or an MRI even. The ultrasound also could be helpful for checking for uh, cavernosal blood flow if you are planning on doing a surgical intervention, especially uh, incision and grafting, just to document how severe their AD may be going in. So one of the guideline statements is clinicians should evaluate and treat a man with Crohn's disease only when they have the experience and diagnostic tools to appropriately evaluate, cancel, and treat the condition. So I think everybody's just got to decide what what you feel comfortable doing, you know, what, you know, what's the level of what you would do for seeing men with Crohn's disease, diagnose and refer, maybe learn to do Zyflex injections or other injection therapy, tunical plication as a surgery, but not, you know, the, some of the more, you know, sophisticated surgeries, you know, implant surgery. I think you just got to get your comfort level and feel that you're, you're able to offer the right thing for men with this condition. What's the aim of treatment? So pain relief, plaque stabilization, plaque dissolution, all that's kind of a misnomer. It's more softening so that there's you know, less impairment of the, the, you know, the elasticity is what we're really shooting for. And ultimately, definitive curvature correction for men whose curvature is making you know, their penis not as functional as it needs to be. So who should be treated? So men with normal erection function, curvature less than 30 degrees, whose pain has resolved and have no progression of curvature, can be observed. So 30 degrees, I mean, it's fairly arbitrary, but that's generally thought to be kind of the border of when the curve becomes a mechanical problem. Less than 30 degrees, probably, you know, not severe enough that it needs treatment. You know, if someone has normal erections, less than 30 degree curvature, it's not progressing, uh, it's not impairing their intercourse tremendously, probably absorption is the best for them. And that's what I told them, I said, there's nothing wrong with not doing anything. If it's functional, if your sex life is okay, just leave as is. That's the, the lowest risk treatment is no treatment for something like this. But men with pain or progressing curvature may you know, benefit from medical therapy. Men whose pain has ceased, so you know it's stabilized, the curvature is stable, but the curve is greater than 30 degrees, having difficulty with intercourse, that's where definitive therapy, including surgery, is, is a reasonable way to approach it. So medical treatment, so oral. So when I gave this talk, you know, 16 years ago, I would have gone through each one of these things, vitamin E, pataba, colchicine, tamoxifen, patoxifiline, and talk about proposed mechanisms of action and why it may help with this. Guess what? None of these are useful. Uh, and the guidelines say basically, don't give any oral therapy. There's just, they're historical um, and just no proven benefit. But you know, when I was a resident, pataba was the big thing. It was like 18 pills a day. So that was a real pain, but I went through all the, the medical oral therapies early in my career, you know, colchicine, tamoxifen, toxifiline was a popular one, maybe, you know, again, 16, 18 years ago. Uh, but today, nothing, just nothing oral other than NSAIDs. So the guy who's still having pain with erections, you know, and is, you know, that's, and that's making the intercourse difficult just because it's not fun to try to have sex, you know, in the pain, you know, is, in the penis is there. You can offer them NSAIDs or recommend NSAIDs. And for guys, you know, I just tell them basically, when you suspect you're gonna attempt sex, take an ibuprofen, an aspirin, something an hour before to get it on board to blunt that discomfort you get with erections. So at least, you know, intercourse isn't unpleasant because of the pain. For men who take PD-5 inhibitors, it's real easy. You just say, hey, you're, you're, you're taking a, your PD-5 inhibitor roughly, you know, an hour before attempting intercourse, Take an ibuprofen with it, that'll help, you know, with the quality of the erection and also with some of the discomfort. But otherwise, in terms of treatment to try to reverse curvature, oral therapy is useless. So injections. Injections are, uh, you know, consistent with the guidelines. And any of these three, the guidelines are okay with offering. Verapamil, collagenase, and interferon. There's also mechanical treatments, so shockwave treatments. Vacuum erection devices may have some utility. Traction devices have become popular. There's one particular uh, device I'll show a little bit later on that I've had some patients uh, utilize. And then transdermal treatments, not recommended. This was huge, again, about 16, 18 years ago, uh, but really no benefit from transdermal treatments, so guidelines recommend against those. So intralesional verapamil, you know, really popularized in the 90s, did a fair number of them uh, with Dr. Montague as 
a resident, did a lot of them the first 10, 12 years that I was in practice here uh, as really the only medical therapy that, that we were offering besides some of the oral therapies for Peyronie's disease. So what's the rationale? Collagen deposition is calcium dependent, verapamil, calcium channel blocker. So maybe it's blocking uh, the, the, the ability to deposit the collagen. Verapamil has also been shown to upregulate collagenase and decrease collagen exocytosis from fibroblasts. So maybe that's the rationale. Larry Levine was a huge proponent of this, and he did a lot of work with it on the 90s. Here was a paper he uh, published 20 years ago, found that there was a 96% improvement in pain for men who went through these uh, series of verapamil injections, 60% change in curvature. And I would say my experience was very similar to this. It was remarkable how many guys who were coming in who were still having pain with erections, you did a cycle or two of the verapamil injections, and they said, the pain's gone uh, with the erections. The change in curvature, that was more variable, and I would say probably about half the guys saw benefit when I looked at it uh, in my series. So here's a study from 13 years ago, randomized intralesional verapamil versus just saline. What if you just, you know, are passing a needle through the plaque, injecting whatever, saline? So they found that the reduction in pain, the decrease in curvature, and the plaque softening was really not significantly different between the two groups, whether it was verapamil or saline. Another uh, group from uh, about 25 years ago, 30% reduction in curvature in patients who are treated with either injections of rapamil, steroids, or saline. So it may not necessarily be something unique about the verapamil that helps. It may just be the mechanical disruption caused by injections. So for verapamil injections, you're really working the needle in and out of the plaque, kind of injecting as you go, which is very different than Xyaflex, which you know, I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so maybe it's just passing the needle through the plaque in multiple passes. You're just disrupting it somehow, and that helps with the pain and maybe softens it enough in some men that you see some reversal of curvature. It may not be the verapamil itself that's doing much of anything. Uh, so how do we do them? So 10 milligrams of verapamil in 10 milliliters of normal saline. I do it every two weeks. I start with six injections uh, and then reassess. I like using a 22-gauge needle, which is a little bigger than some, a lot of people use 25. I just have come close to breaking off needles, hitting these really hard plaques with the 25-gauge needle. So I think the 22-gauge needle, it's, it's firmer. I'm, I'm less worried about bending it or breaking it and passing it through the, the plaque. I like a control syringe uh, so that I can, you know, you know, make sure I'm just, you know, having good uh, ability to control the depth of the penetration. I have nailed my finger when I've been pushing against the plaque and I'm holding the plaque, and it's just super tough, and all of a sudden it gives, and boom, right through into my finger. Having a control syringe is a little bit better. I think you can ma you know, maintain that depth and not just lose control of it as you're trying to push in with a regular syringe. Uh, and after the first um, six injections, kind of reassess whether they're getting any benefit or not. Bruising, um, pain at the injection site. You know, some guys have gotten pretty black and blue, pretty swollen from some bleeding. After I do the injection, I do hold pressure for like five minutes, compressing the penis between my hand, just try to stop any oozing uh, and reduce the bruising and swelling. So basically, here's just a you know, picture that you're working the needle in and out of the plaque and slowly pressing the, the, the syringe so you're depositing the drug kind of as you go in and out. But a lot of it's just passing that needle through the plaque would be helpful. Uh, so... Interferon injections. There are some people who really are big proponents. I know Wayne Hellstrom in uh, New Orleans, uh, big interferon guy, uh, but it's not FDA approved. It's expensive, and there's some like flu-like symptoms that you can get with uh, the uh, interferon injections. I've never done them, but again, some people swear by them. They're okay per the AUA guidelines. But uh, collagenase, uh, Zyaflex, the brand name, that's really you know the FDA approved. Uh, injection therapy, so that's the one that I go with for the vast majority of men. The only men I do rapamol on these days are men who just can't get insurance coverage for the Zyaflex, and that's you know one every kind of, you know three months, six months. The Zyaflex is actually really well uh, covered by the vast majority of insurances. I think partly because it's FDA approved. So a cycle is an in-office injection to make sure you can see the point of maximum concavity. You mark that with a marking pen, that's the place that you're gonna place the, the, uh, the Zyaflex. 
you need then the patient's penis to get flaccid. Often it goes down on its own in the you know, sterile environment of an office room. Sometimes you need to do a phenylephrine injection to get them down. And then you do the injection. It's 0.25 ml. So it's a very small volume of fluid that's injected transversely into the plaque at the point of maximal concavity as you mark it with that erection. One to three days later, a second injection. And then one to three days after that, an, a modeling procedure where you basically are just bending the plaque over your finger, kind of using it as a fulcrum, trying to start that process of softening it, loosening it up. And then the patient does stretching exercises and modeling themselves for six weeks. You can do this cycle of the two injections with six weeks of stretching up to four times, uh, you know, six weeks apart. Uh, it works well for my practice. I'm in clinic at One South Park Street Fridays and Mondays. So Fridays are the big first injection day. Those appointments take longer because you've got to do an artificial erection. So that takes, you know, injection five, 10 minutes, wait for them to get rigid, mark it, wait for them to get flaccid or knock them down, then do the injection. Then Monday's a quicker appointment because the mark of the point of maximum concavity should still be there. And so you know where to go. You just have to mix up the Zyflex. The Zyflex comes as a powder and it needs to be refrigerated. Um, and then you have a dilutant that you use to reconstitute the, the powder. Uh, and then it's just, again, 0.25 mLs that you inject. And that I use a very tiny needle uh, to minimize discomfort and to be able to just to sneak it into the plaque and inject into the plaque. The biggest challenge with, with Zyflex, frankly, is the technical aspect of it, to be able to stabilize the plaque and inject the needle into the plaque, not above it, not below it, not short of it, not into the corpora. Um, uh, that's uh, the, uh, the technical challenge of it. Um, so, the uh, phase three studies, you know, this was published uh, back in 2013 that led to the FDA approval in 2014. Um, uh, so, basically, it's, um, you know, showing with collagenase, it mean 34% improvement in curvature, and it mean, uh, you know, 17 degree change, you know, reduction in curvature. And um, for placebo, it was only 18% in curvature and, you know, three degree change for each uh, subject. Can I get this for me? Can you get this page for me? Thanks. Um, so, you know, definitely better than placebo and enough to justify um, the uh, uh, FDA approval. So here was just some graphing from their studies, you can see the Zyflex, the improvement in the curvature deformity better than with just placebo. All right, adverse reactions. So bruising, swelling, pain, these are the things that you can see with this. And some guys get really black and blue, uh, pre-swollen. I've had a few guys, it extends into the scrotum, extends into the suprapubic area. So what I've been doing lately is telling guys to make sure that they elevate the penis, you know, try to wear tight underwear to keep the penis pointing upright for the first couple of days after a Zyflex injection, and also to ice the, um, the penis with, um, you, know, uh, for, you know, the first day after the injection to make sure they try to reduce some of this bruising and swelling. Penile fracture or corporal rupture is a potential risk. And the way to try to minimize that risk is for guys to avoid any kind of sexual activity for four weeks after the, their cycle of injections. We used to tell them two weeks, but the company was finding that some guys were having this even at two weeks. So now they recommend that it's four weeks without any sexual activity after the injections. So uh, guidelines are okay with this for penile curvature in patients, stable Peyronie's disease, curvature greater than 30 and less than 90, and intact erectile function. Again, you know, make sure they understand the penis could look pretty black and blue and that they cannot have sex for four weeks or they risk a corporal rupture. Uh, some, you know, post-approval studies found similar, you know, results. You know, 57% uh, it negated the need for surgery. Uh, about half penetration was restored. 81% um, thought the treatment was meaningful. And 88% uh, reported subjective improvement after four injections with the uh, mean degree of curvature improvement about 23 degrees. And so what I tell guys, I say, look, I say, if you go through the Zyflex treatments, I would say about two thirds of guys see some benefit and the average you know, degree of improvement is probably gonna be around 20 degrees. 
But if you're at 45 degrees, and that can get you down under 30 degrees, where it's more likely to be functional enough that you could have uh, adequate intercourse. So I think it's a very reasonable treatment for a lot of guys. Uh, for Crino, I mentioned this real briefly. This was again popular about 20 years ago. And somebody actually studied, is it getting to the, to the plaque? So verapamilcrine was applied prior to implant surgery. They did a biopsy of the tunica to look for verapamil and none seen. So it just doesn't get to where it needs to go. So not recommended. Iantophoresis was a way of trying to force the, the drug into the tunica with an electric current, but did not work well. Um, that's just kind of the setup to get that drug onto the plaque, um, but not recommended. Shockwaves. So some guys will read about shockwaves if they, you know, Google Peyronie's disease. And here's a study from 18 years ago. It was effective in improving penile pain, but does not seem to affect the curvature. Um, a study from 13 years ago that was a, a randomized um, good study for tr weekly treatment sessions of a bunch of shockwaves. Pain again improved, no change in curvature. So for the guidelines, it may be used to improve penile pain, but not used to try to improve curvature. So I've never done a shockwave treatment on a guy's penis for Peyronie's disease. Here's that uh, traction device that I mentioned earlier, Restore X. A uh, gentleman actually on Monday brought his in for me to see. We were doing a, a second Zyflex injection, and he wants to start using this too. I told him to wait a you know, few weeks to try to reduce the chance of uh, any kind of a fracture or rupture. And, um, um, but you can see the penis goes into the base. The base of the penis goes in here, and this clamps down just behind the corona. And then it's got this spring system that applies tension to the plaque. So you have to wear this for hours on end for it to help. You know, the, uh, Larry Levine talks about using traction as akin to braces. And you can move teeth within the jaw with just constant pressure. That's what braces do. So why can't you do something similar with the penis? But you think about braces, they're on 24-7, 365 for years to be able to do that manipulation. Or people who do like the uh, Invisalign, it's, you know, they're wearing that a lot. So it's not going to help to throw this on for five minutes a day and say, oh, you know, here I am, you know, I'm going to straighten out with this. You know, it's, it's a commitment of time to be able to, do, you know, get some benefit from something like this. Uh, so Larry Levine talked, had another device that he studied, found that there was, you know, some improvement curvature. But penile length is probably where these are most helpful. They can restore some of the penile length that guys lose by just stretching that plaque, getting some elasticity back. Uh, you know, here, that study, they were using it five hours per day for six months, you know, maybe a little bit of decrease in curvature, but the, pe uh, the stretched and uh, flaccid penile length increased a centimeter and a half or so for the stretched length. So potentially some benefit. And that's why I tell guys, I said, nah, it may not help your curvature, but if you're distressed by loss of length, applying something like this may help to get some elasticity and get some length back. But for you know, a lot of men, surgery is going to be the ultimate fix for this. So there are reconstructor procedures and then penile prosthesis. And as we talked about um, you know, at the journal club last week, you know, looking at the, the devices, there's definitely a role for uh, penile implant surgery. So tunical plication procedures are basically shortening the long side is the way to think about it. Plaque excision or incision with grafting is trying to lengthen the short side. Uh, so they definitely need a preoperative evaluation with an erection that you can see yourself to know exactly what they have to help with surgical planning. An assessment of the potency, documentation of the deformity, assessment of stretched flaccid length, because you gotta tell them this is gonna be as long as it's gonna be, uh, especially after a plication procedure. And you know, bas basically, it's got to be stable disease and then assess who's a candidate for surgery. So the Nesbitt is kind of a historical uh, operation where an ellipse of tunic albuginia would be excised on the, the long side, uh, convex side. And then you close the defect with an absorbable stitch to allow scar scarification to maintain that straightening. So that you know, works. Uh, Heineke Miklitz is a proceed, you know, type of uh, a way of shortening it up. So basically a longitudinal incision on the long side, and then you close it horizontally. So that's going to shorten the tunica where you do these high um, uh incisions. Um, so some people will make two you know, partial thickness shavings and then bring those together to shorten it. Uh, with absorb All this is done with absorbable stitches and you're counting on a scarification for it to work. So here would be an example of 
using that uh, kind of a longitudinal incision, and then you pull the edges apart, you know, horizontally, and then close it horizontally. So point A to point B is now point A to point B here. You've shortened it by that much length. So this is something that's had a series of these. This is on the dorsum of the penis uh, to shorten it up. Here's, uh, again, an example of that, making two parallel incisions and then bringing the edges of the tunica together with sutures so that then this is going to heal to that and you've shortened it up by this amount. Um, you know, so that's going to, again, shorten alongside, help bring it straight. But the, the Lou 16 dot procedure is really probably the most popular way to do this these days. Um, so Tom Lou, um, you know, described this back 20 years ago. And it's using a, a, a permanent suture to, you know, just tighten up the tunica on the long side and maintain that straightening that way. So it's a lot simpler. Um, and he's, you know, published really good results, 93% straight, some residual curvature, you know, minimal impact on erectile function because you're not doing anything to really cut into the, um, uh, the erectile chamber. But penile shortening with any of these things is going to be definitely uh, uh, something to think about. So here again, in the operating room, you do the erection, you see the curvature, you're trying to shorten this up to make it straight. So you can either put clamps on or just place your sutures and tighten them up to get it straight. So for someone who has dorsal curvature, you place the sutures uh, on either side of the urethra on the ventrum of the penis. And that when you tighten these up will help bend straight. For someone with ventral curvature, you just wanna go between the neurovascular bundles and the deep dorsal vein, put the stitches in, tighten them up. Again, this has to be a permanent suture. You, uh, I typically use 2 epibond. Uh, so it's braided, it's a little softer. The knots aren't going to stick out as much. They'll lie flat once you put those knots in. Um, so basically, it's just, yeah, you're moving point A to point B, and that shortens up that, you know, a bit of uh, tunica, and that helps to bend it straight. And basically, you're matching the limited side by shortening up the long side. Who's good for a placation procedure? Somebody who has a longer penis, uh, who does not have ED or ED that's managed just with medical therapy, someone who doesn't have like an hourglass or big indentation, and generally more mild curvature would work best for this. What's the complications? Shortening is definitely something you've got to warn guys about and you know, show them preoperatively. Here's your stretch beyond length. It's not gonna be any longer than this. Indentation um, can occur. It's important to not put the plicating sutures right where the point of maximum concavity is. I go a couple centimeters distal, a couple centimeters proximal, so you're kind of averaging that shortening out over the length of the long side. You don't want to shorten or indent the, pe uh, the penis right where the plaque is on the other side because now you'll create an hourglass defect and create kind of a hinge defect. So you want to go distal and proximal to the, uh, the plaque site. You could potentially feel the sutures. There's pain with erections. You're counting on those sutures, creating tension to hold the penis straight. And so guys early on, you know, with nocturnal erections, wake up, you know, in, in you know, pretty bad pain. There's things you could do to try to suppress those uh, erections. They don't always work, you know, perfectly. Uh, I've had a few guys through the years, after months and months of ha still having pain with erections, ask for the sutures to be removed. And so I've taken out a couple sets of plicating sutures you know, through the years because of just persistent pain with erections that, um, or because the knots, they just were bothered by them, they wanted them out. Grafting procedure. So this is basically conceptually trying to make the side that has the plaque longer to be able to get a straight penis. So a number of different uh, graft, uh, you know, substances have been used. When I was a resident, Dr. Amati used to always use skin so we would take a big graft uh, or you know, skin from like a hairless part of the lower abdomen. And then once we would harvest that, we would very carefully scrape off the epidermis uh, to just, just basically the dermis. Um, and then I would close the um, donor site while he would go get coffee for you know, 20 minutes. And then we'd come in and we put the, the graft onto the penis that we already had prepared, you know, ready to, you know, with the plaque cut out, ready just to suture in the, the graft. Off the uh, shelf tissues, cadaveric tissues, probably the most popular thing these days. And historically, some synthetics were also used. So Devine and Horton popularized full excision of the entire plaque with replacement by a dermal graft. Uh, but you can get graft contraction, and ED is the big issue with these. 
So you've got to warn guys that there's a significant risk that they can get some erectile dysfunction when you're doing a plaque excision and graft procedure. So rather than excising the whole plaque to try to you know, reduce some of the damage to the underlying corporal tissue, you know, modern techniques are to do more like an H incision. So here would have been something where you're taking out the entire plaque. You've got to obviously mobilize the nerve vascular bundle in Buck's fascia to get right to the tunica albuginea, and this is cutting out the you know, plaque on the dorsum of the penis, and then you fill this space with a graft material that has more elastic properties like the tunica itself should have. This would be, again, more modern. You'd, you know, here's the area of the plaque. You cut into the plaque and it's kind of this H incision or kind of like back-to-back -back Y incisions. And so then you create this gap without excising anything. So hopefully you minimize some of the potential injury to the underlying corporal tissue, and then you fill the gap in with graft material, oops, with graft material um, and try to, again, lengthen the side that has the plaque. Cadaveric pericardium is nice because it's again off the shelf. Um, good success with that. Um, pericardial grafting. Um, vein, you know, Tom Liu used to use uh, the, the saphenous vein. Uh, blades through these because we're running out of time. Uh, SIS, uh, submucosal, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 tissue could be used. So good results with that. So I think the bottom line is whatever you're using, it's something that should have good elastic properties. So there's buccal mucosa that's been used. Um, but these guys who you want to do a grafting procedure are going to be guys with shorter penises, more severe curvature, like, you know, 60 to 90 degrees, uh, no erectile dysfunction or erectile dysfunction man success with the medical therapy, or the guys who have the real bad hourglass because you can expand not just length, but width and girth of the penis by putting one of these grafts in. Again, shortening, numbness, ED is the big thing, potential recurrence. So penile prosthesis, you know, again, we talked about that uh, last week at Journal Club. Uh, so when patients have Crohn's disease and ED that's pretty severe, for example, needing injection therapy or vacuum device, what may make sense is to fix both problems with one surgery, uh, but you may need to do penile modeling or incision of the tunica or plicating sutures to get it straight. So Steve Wilson wrote up his experience doing uh, IPP placement and manual modeling, modeling and had a 90% satisfaction rate. Uh, Colley Carson, similarly, good results with us. Some of my happiest patients when I was doing penile implants were the guys who we did it for Cronies and ED because both problems were just fixed and they had, you know, just a really functional penis, whereas they for a long time not had one. So surgical therapy, you know, may offer penile prosthesis to patients with Crohn's disease and erectile dysfunction or penile deformity that's uh, sufficient to provide, uh, prevent coitus despite pharmacotherapy or vacuum device. Uh, you may need to use intraoperative procedures like the modeling we had talked about. You clamp the tubes coming out of the cylinders and you just bend the penis straight and hold it for like a minute. Um, but it should be an inflatable, not a malleable for Crohn's disease. So in conclusion, wait until pain and progression of curvature cease before thinking about surgery. Interlesional injections are reasonable treatments for patients who are willing to, to go through that uh, if the disease is still progressing and are not yet ready for surgery or don't want to do surgery. Oral therapies have zero role these days other than NSAIDs for pain. And ultimately, the degree of curvature, piano length, rectal stas is going to dictate your best surgery. Thanks. Happy to take just a minute or two of questions so we can move on to MM. Thanks, Dr. Pallone. Uh, questions for Dr. Pallone? Comments? Dr. I have a, kind of an easy, easy one, maybe. Um, if you're seeing a patient that has Peyronie's, but let's say they're not currently sexually active, uh, which we see these guys at the VA a fair amount, I feel like. Um, and I'm like, okay, you know, you reassure them. I think sometimes they're concerned about the curve, but but maybe it's bothering them. Maybe not, they're not in pain, but they're just bothered that it's curved. It's almost like it's not a cosmetic operation, but how how do you approach these guys that maybe aren't sexually active or, or maybe they're worried because they might meet somebody and I should get this fixed? Yeah, no, that's a tremendous question because you do see that a lot. You know, I'll ask, well, how is this impacting intercourse? I don't know. 
I don't have a partner, I'm not attending a course. But it looks like it would make it challenging, right? You hear that a lot. Or some guys will say it, it makes masturbation difficult, and I don't like that. I, I used to be you know, more you know, hardcore saying, well, I'm not going to do anything because we don't know. Now I've softened a little bit, uh, and I say, look, I, I, if I see it and it's really as a curvature that I agree is probably going to make intercourse difficult, I can appreciate that them going into a new relationship having that might issue. And so I'm willing to, to treat men who are not actively sexually active for the Peronis disease when it fits the criteria that, yeah, it's greater than 30 degrees, it's clear to me that it would present a problem or likely to present a problem. But it is a little dicey. I mean, you know, I, I had a guy once, really in my career, I put a penile implant in him. And I remember when it eventually eroded and we took it out, you know how many times he used it? Zero, right? So stuff like that, you, you really want to avoid, right? So, so I think that's, that's the a judgment. But I think it's reasonable to, to consider treatment for somebody who has this, all the signs and symptoms of it, is maybe not sexually active at the time, but definitely it would present a problem. Anything else? Yes. Dave, uh, just two, two brief comments and a question. So one comment is about the stretching exercises. Um, the Levine data, like his device that I think is no longer available, that was the one that it took hours and hours a day of stretching. The, the RestoreX device, which Landon Trost uh, helped develop, um, one, one thing that they kind of approached was uh, shorter daily stretching time so they their their current protocol is like two 30 minute episodes per day or you know the stretching exercises per day um and they've got some data out there but um so it's no longer that like five six hours that, that they they done some of the original ones um second comment is that there's a new app uh there was just an email from the sms uh, society just either last week or the week before there's a new app called pd scan uh, that's available on the app store that allows patients to actually take pictures of uh, of their curvature, and it like it constructs a three D model that they can then send to their provider and try to help document their their curvature. Um, so there, there's a lot of there are a lot of efforts out there being made to try to help with the initial diagnosis. I have a protractor Thanks. app on my phone, so I would take guys' pictures onto my phone, and I would try, apply this protractor app to try to show their, the, the degree of curvature. So. Yeah. so so, if people are interested in downloading that, I, I, I downloaded it. It looks like it's pretty user-friendly, um, but the PD scan. So the, the, the question is, uh, you know, the collagen, or collagenase versus or rapamil injections, to my knowledge, there are no head-to-head -head studies comparing a lot of these uh, injectable therapies. How, how do you counsel patients you know, about one versus the other? Um, you know, and I'll preface that by saying I know, you know, 70 years ago, uh, you and I, I think, arm wrestled uh, to determine who was going to do the Zyflex, who was going to continue with the VRAP mills. But how, how do you counsel patients about those two different options for, uh, for those who are interested in wanting injectional therapy? Yeah. No, that's, yeah, I would say Zyflex FDA approved, VRAP will not. Zyflex, you know, went through, you know, phase three trials against placebo, good studies showing benefit, rap mill, retrospective, or you know, weak studies, not FDA approved. For me, that's, that's the bottom line. That's the main thing. All right, thanks. Cool. Well, th thank you, Dr. Pallone. And for, uh, for those on the WebExes, uh, we're going to finish this WebEx, and we're going to switch over to a different WebEx for the m, &M sessions. Thanks to everybody who uh, joined us. I saw there were a couple of names of uh, some of our, our alums. Thanks for your attendance this morning. Have a great uh, Thanksgiving holiday.